Dr. Abdul Aziz to speak on the prevention, screening, and treatment of cancer of the cervix, which will then be followed by a Q&A session. After that, we will present a short video message compiled by Taylor University medical students to raise awareness and support for the Cervical Cancer Elimination Initiative. Followed by that, we will have a talk by our Batch 11 MBBS graduate, Taylor's University, Dr. Yvonne Peng, entitled, Don't Fear the Smear. Then, we are also very fortunate today to have Ms. Genevi with us as she will share her experience as a cervical cancer survivor. And before the end of the symposium, we will have a prize giving ceremony to the winners of the Students and Power Quiz and Infographic Competition. And finally, a closing remark will be delivered by Professor Dr. Lin Yang Mui. In addition, for medical doctors who wish to collect their CPD points, the QR code will be provided at the end of this symposium, so stay tuned. Last but not least, this symposium is currently being recorded and streamed live on our Facebook and YouTube account, so you may share this video across all social media platforms to further spread today's message. Now, to officially start the Cervical Cancer Symposium, I would like to welcome Associate Professor Dr. Ganesh Ramachandran, Head of School of Medicine, Taylor's University, Malaysia, to deliver his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicole. Um, and thank you, everyone, for making time on this um, Wednesday morning to attend uh, this symposium. On the 17th of November, 2020, the Secretary General of the World Health Organization uh, announced an initiative to eliminate cervical cancer in the community by the turn of the century. And today marks the first anniversary of the launch of that initiative. Cervical cancer remains a major cause of mortality and morbidity worldwide and it is among the top 10 cancers in almost every list that you look for. In Malaysia, cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer among women and the eighth most common cancer among men and women combined. And it contributes significantly to uh, morbidity and mortality in our country as well. The cloud in the silver, uh, or the, the, the silver lining in the cloud is that this cancer is uh, preventable because we have good screening methods as well as an effective vaccine to prevent cervical cancer. Today's event is a culmination of events that began earlier this month, uh, which had student tracks in the form of quizzes. Uh, infographics, as well as video messages for which we had participation of students, both from the Taylor's Medical School, as well as other medical schools in Malaysia. And we are very happy that uh, other schools took part as well. Uh, we had the first session on the 13th. And today uh, we have uh, the final uh, day of the symposium with interesting talks by eminent speakers to discuss uh, treatment for cervical cancer, the support that is available for cervical cancer, as well as uh, what I think is perhaps a very important uh, patient advocacy and patient experience story from someone who has survived this disease. I hope all of you uh, will stay tuned throughout the event, and I hope all of you enjoy and benefit from this event. And once again, I thank you for your presence here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Associate Professor Dr. Ganesh. For all participants, if you have any questions anytime during the symposium, you may ask your questions in the Slido link displayed now. You may scan the QR code with your phone and it shall bring you to the page directly. Your questions will be answered by the speakers during the Q&A session later. It is now time to invite our first distinguished speaker of this symposium. With that, I would like to call upon Associate Professor Dr. Yong Chai Hong, Associate Professor in Medical Physics, 
School of Medicine, Taylor's University, Malaysia, to chair this next session. Over to you, Professor Yong. Thank you very much, Nicole. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes. Okay, thank you, Nicole. And good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this uh, very meaningful webinar made to all of us uh, in this Survival Cancer Week uh, month. And this morning, uh, we are really honored to have Tato Soundary with us again. Dr. Sandri is not uh, new to us. We have the privilege to invite uh, Dr. Sandri last year as well for our Cancer Survival uh, Awareness Webinar. And this year again, we have this honor to have Dr. Sandri with us. Uh, Dr. Sandri is the current president of the National Cancer Society in Malaysia. She is also the board member for the UNION for International Cancer Control, UICC. Also a board member for the International Cancer Information Service Group as well as the board member for the ASEAN Non-Communicable Diseases Alliance. And with over 20 years experience in cancer control, Dr. Sounds have advocates for, um, <clears throat> sorry, for the awareness, prevention, early detection, and survivorship of cancer. Within Malaysia, these initiatives are driven through the National Cancer Society of Malaysia, and the, it's the nation's very first cancer NGO in its education, care, and support programs. NCSM also hosted the World Congress, World Cancer Congress in 2018. Dr. Sound studied medicine in Dublin, Ireland, and she has an MBA from the University of Bath. Locally, she also on the board of the Secretary of the Malaysian Women's Action Tobacco Control and Health, My Watch, and the Malaysian Council for Tobacco Control. The accumulation of clinical, educational, operational, and counseling skills, as well as the different experiences, has provided her a comprehensive picture of the benefits, challenges, needs, and gaps of cancer control in ASEAN. And in November 2020, she was conferred the Dajar Dato Patuga Makoda Para Award, carrying the title Dato by His Royal Highness of Sudan of Para. And today we have this great honor to have Dato Sound with us again to talk on the topics for support and care for survivor cancer patients. Dato Sound, thank you very much for your time, and we are very honored to have you here today. Thank you, Dr. Young, for that lovely um, introduction. And it's wonderful to be here again with Taylor's um, University. It's it's amazing. Um, the amount of work that you do in cancer and um, the health promotion that you do in cancer. And it, it will make a difference to the community and to all Malaysians in the long run. Um, I've been asked this morning to talk a little bit about um, survivorship, about how to look after people with cancer. Um, and I'm going to try to share my slides now. Hopefully it works. Um, yes. So, um, so my talk this morning is going to be about support and care for uh, cervical cancer survivors. And um, the first thing before we actually hone into um, specifically cervical cancer survivors, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what does survivorship mean um, to people. There's a lot of different definitions in terms of survivorship, um, but they essentially say the same thing. So a survivor is someone from the moment of diagnosis and for the remainder of their life, um, the individual diagnosis cancer is called a survivor. The, it, it expanded with the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention to say that the impact of cancer on family members, friends and caregivers of survivors are acknowledged as part of survivorship as well. So that means that survivorship doesn't just um, when we talk about survivorship and we talk about helping people in terms of survivorship, we're not just talking about the person with cancer. We're talking about the people who are impacted by that cancer as well, which means generally the family members around them as well. And thirdly, you know, the National Cancer Survivorship Initiative 2010 expanded it a little bit more to just to say that survivorship also includes those in um, where their cancers have come back again. So it's just not those whose cancers have gone away, um, but its survivorship also encompasses those that are living with cancer, meaning that, um, that they're not cured, but they continue to live with cancer um, 
or if their cancer has come back. So with active or advanced disease. So it really um, envelops everything there is um, from the point of diagnosis to the point um, you pass away from cancer. When someone is diagnosed with cancer, you know, it, it changes everything that is familiar in our life. And it, it, it's a snap change. It's not something that you gradually think is going to happen. It just happens overnight. So um, it's difficult to know um, and understand what you're feeling. And this um, series of drawings are done by Michelle Angelo Petron, who um, uh, was a cancer survivor. Um, he had lymphoma. And he, he actually, um, he's an artist and he drew and he spoke about how he felt with a cancer diagnosis. Um, and this is one thing he said, you know, outcast, marginalized, ostracized. And I think that's very, very important to understand when it comes, um, when a cancer diagnosis comes to you, is that there's an overwhelming sense of being apart from everybody else, of losing your identity and not knowing um, whether or not you'll feel the ground beneath you again. And so when it comes to survivors' needs, what do we talk about? You know, um, a lot of survivors say that they feel that they're in a sinking boat, that no matter what they do, they're trying to bail themselves out, you know, taking the, taking the container and, and throwing the water out of the boat when there's a hole in it. You feel, you still feel that you're sinking lower and lower. And so the immediate um, reaction is that you have fear, confusion, and a loss of self-anchor. Um, you don't know what is real anymore. And you're starved. You're starved for information, understanding, how to navigate the system. This is a system which to us as health professionals, you might think, oh, it's quite easy to get through. But to someone who's just exposed to it at the worst possible time in their life, um, it's a maze. So generally, um, we're not just not talking about cervical cancer here, but we're just generally talking about cancer here. People will have psychosocial issues, including anxiety, depression, isolation, negative self-image. And then you've got the physical effects from cancer and its treatment. Um, and then you might get other cancers and then there might be fear of recurrence or secondary cancer. So there's a lot of there's a lot of information um, and there's a lot of fears which are swimming through everybody's minds. So as I mentioned, the maze of trees, I'm confused, I'm lost in terms of which way to turn and who to turn to. And this is where we, um, as medical professionals, as the community, as friends, this is where we come in. This is where we need to be there um, to help them know how to go through that maze, how to navigate that maze. So just to recap, you know, surrounding survivorship includes the mental, mental and physical and effects of cancer. It also includes issues that relate to the follow-up care, um, including regular health and wellness checks, late effects of treatment, cancer recurrence, second, you know, second cancer, so quality of life. A lot of people think that cancer is an immediate thing. So once you look after the immediate impact of cancer, you know, people can move on. Um, you can forget about that friend um, because they've already got through cancer, but that's not true. Cancer is lifelong. So there are going to be different stages in their life that they're going to need assistance. Um, even if they look well, even if, um, you know, they go back to work and, and you think that everything is okay. Um, the impact of survivorship or the impact of cancer can occur at any time throughout their whole survivorship. And as mentioned, it includes not just the survivor, but the family members and caregivers and friends as well. Um, this is a busy slide, but the dark green is basically the potential long-term and late effects of treatment. And the light green is the effect on the cancer survivor. So you can see it's a, it's a multitude of aspects. You know, you've got pain, cognitive impairment, sexual dysfunction, hot flushes, peripheral neuropathy. So those are the physical aspects of it. But how that could impact on a person is that, you know, you can have economic problems because of treatment costs, um, struggling to find a meaning in your life, 
because you feel that you've lost your identity. The whole social isolation because you feel that people don't understand what you're going through. So there's a lot of things which happen to a survivor. And that is um, just, uh, you know, that encapsulates what it means to be a survivor. But with cervical cancer, um, there's an added dimension to it. And that added dimension comes from HPV. And I know uh, I'm not going to talk about um, um, the risk factors so much of, of uh, cervical cancer, but I think it's important to understand why cervical cancer could be considered to be a little bit unique. Um, and this is why. In um, the late 2000s, um, WHO basically gave a definition of what is um, cervical cancer. And yes, you know, it, it, it stated this whole thing of cervical cancer starts with the cells grow out, you know, grow out of control, et cetera, et cetera. But what is important here is to see that their last para here, nearly all cervical, cervical cancers are linked to infection with the human papillomavirus, HPV. That threw a different dimension into cervical cancer because now cervical cancer was linked to an HPV infection, which is a STD, STI, sorry, a sexually transmitted infection. And with sexually transmitted infections, there's a different dimension in terms of um, the psychological and, and, and the social impact of having um, HPV. The whole idea that, oh, you know, it's a STI. So it means that you have done something wrong, um, that you might have had multiple sex partners, um, whether you, know, you haven't been monogamous in your marriage, all these things came into this whole, um, this whole diagnosis of uh, cervical cancer, which was never there before. And that brings a whole different um, psychosocial dimension to cervical cancer diagnosis. Now, this is from a study which just looked at the social and psychological consequences of a positive HPV test. It doesn't talk about uh, uh, cervical cancer at all. It's just having a positive HPV test. Um, yes, you have the shock, um, but what you do have here, um, which is slightly different from other cancers, is the shame and stigma because HPV is a STI, the sexually transmitted um, infection. And that brings questions about trust and fidelity within your own relationship. So it, it brings questions to a relationship where if you, know, you have a partner, when you initially have a diagnosis of cancer, usually your partner is your strongest ally. It's the person you know, who is your rock throughout this whole journey. But with HPV, um, because um, there's questions about relationships and sexuality, et cetera, et cetera, that relationship can be severed or it can be severely tested. Um, and therefore the support that, that women with cervical cancer think that they have might be eroded and there might be distrust. And because of that as well, people might not actually want to tell pe other people that they have a cervical cancer diagnosis. Um, and there's concerns about sexual relationships and transmissions, et cetera. This again is a very busy slide, but if you just look at the yellow and the green, the yellow are people who only know that um, HPV is a um, sexually transmitted infection. The green is um, those who know that it's a sexually transmitted um, infection and understand the prevalence about it. And you can see that with understanding, so with the light green, um, that anxiety is slightly less, that stigma is slightly less, that shame is slightly less. So what this really shows is that there needs to be a lot more information, there needs to be a lot more health promotion about what um, HPV is about. 
um, so that we can decrease that stigma and we can decrease that shame um, that people might feel with having a HPV infection. And um, the emotional responses, yes, you can have the negative emotions and you can have the neutral emotions. And yes, this is only to testing positive for HPV, but it's reflective on how ca um, cervical cancer patients feel as well. And we need to be sensitive to this and we need to hone in on this when we talk about support um, to women with cervical cancer. So um, the main things are, you know, the emotional aspects of it, the co cognitive where, you know, you might have sexual concerns, you might have stigma, relationship concerns, et cetera, and the negative behaviors, which that might lead to. So you have impact on relationships, the social impact, the non-disclosure. Um, and for, um, from what we've seen in India and Nepal and um, in African countries, that also leads to women not seeking conventional treatment when it comes to cervical cancer, that they're more willing to go to alternative treatments because they don't want to disclose they have um, a sexually transmitted um, linked cancer. Um, and so we ha really have to break that perception that it is anybody's fault um, that you develop a certain type of cancer. So what types of support are out there? Everything you need to know. Um, sometimes one finds the resources to fight the unimaginable situation. Um, information and sharing of this is so important. I found it easier to face similar challenges, although my solutions were often different. Um, and shared experiences form a common bond. So what it is really saying, the number one is information is key. And two, sharing um, how valuable it is to be able to share with someone um, what you've gone through, what difficulties that you've had. So where can NGOs play a part in this? And NGOs can play a part in all aspects of cancer. But what I, what I just you know, boxed in here was, you know, screening and the diagnosis and the treatment and the survivorship aspect of it. There's so many things. Um, there's so many areas that NGOs and, um, and communities um, can impact on in terms of the navigation for a, or the journey of a um, cancer survivor. So it's a community awareness, decreasing the stigma associated with it, giving information, ensuring that people are informed so they can make um, better uh, better personal centric, personalized centric um, decisions on how they want to proceed in terms of their treatment. Of course, direct medical services, you know, basic uh, material provision, emotional support, financial support, advocacy, et cetera, et cetera. When we talk about professional support, um, a lot of people think that professional support just comes from the doctors or, you know, the, the clinical, the, your health professionals involved in the treatment of a patient with cancer. However, um, there is professional support beyond the treatment, meaning that in, in many cases, in both public and private sector, because of the limitations of time, a lot of doctors, a lot of healthcare professionals, um, cannot give that time to a patient to explain it further, to explain what's happening further. And so many of the decisions are made um, mostly by the doctor with the patient acquiescing or agreeing to it because they don't know any better. So there's a lack of definitive best practice guidelines in caring for survivors. You know, um, survivors get lost in transition. Once they're newly diagnosed, um, a doctor might send them to a different doctor for treatment. But in that transition, because there's outside chatter, other people tell them something else to do, or maybe you should try this, or maybe you should do this, or maybe you should wait, etc. Patients can get lost, and they actually don't get timely treatment because you know they wait a month, they wait two months, they wait six months, they try alternative treatments, etc. During treatment, because of the impact of the treatment. People lose confidence, um, they lose their self-esteem, they lose their identity. And so they decide, I don't want to do this treatment anymore. 
And so they drop out, there's no compliance. So it's very important that we support them throughout this transitional period um, to ensure that from the day they're diagnosed to, you know, to whenever um, they have that support that they required. And this loss of transition also, you know, from oncology settings, so from the hospital settings, to once they finish their treatment, back to the primary care setting, back to the community, a lot of people feel disenfranchised. Um, they feel as if, you know, they've been dropped, that nobody really cares for them anymore. So it's very important to support them throughout those transitions, because if you don't, you're going to have delays in treatment, compliance with treatment and follow up as well. So here, it's really important to have cancer, cancer plans is they don't have to be, you know, mega cancer plans, but at least have a framework for the patient to be able to follow, to be able to understand um, where their journey is going to take them, what, you know, what obstacles they're going to, to face, where are the areas which might be a little bit easier, which areas are going to be a little bit more challenging, et cetera. How does that link to the survivor's values and the preference of care? And that really depends on whether they are a young survivor or an older survivor. So someone with, um, who, who got cancer in their 30s um, who still want to have um, children compared to someone who in their 60s who have already had their children, you know, where the, where the whole idea of their fertility, their sexuality might not impact them as much as someone in their 30s, we need to be cognizant of this and we need to be sensitive to the needs of people. And then beyond the treatment, you've also got un, unmet needs. So the medical, the functional, the psychosocial consequences of cancer and its treatment. Um, how does a cervical cancer impact on sexuality? And it impacts enormously, um, even more so than breast cancer. Um, the distress that you might have, the chronic pain, the fatigue, so here it's important to have a patient provider and system-led intervention. So it's not just, oh, you know, the doctor tells me I should do it this way. Um, the patient um, has to be involved in it as well. They have to be involved in how they want to be cared for, what is important to them. So we need to address the psychosocial, the lifestyle, the physical problems, et cetera, to improve the clinical outcomes. And community as well, you know, the role of support, the information, the coping mechanisms, the self-management, et cetera. Um, and there are different me mechanisms of support here, the counseling, peer support, support groups, education groups, programs. And this can be anywhere. It doesn't have to be in a medical NGO such as the National Cancer Society. Mechanisms of support can be, you know, can be evolved, it can be in your own university. Um, it's just to make sure that people have a place that they can come to or someone they can talk to when they feel that um, they need. And mechanisms of support is, is just not sitting there and trying to look at the, the emotional needs of the patient, but it's also the practical assistance, you know, the insurance, the financial, the legal, the rehab. So all this can be done within the community. And, you know, Taylor's is a community in itself. So all these things can be something which you can incorporate into your whole ecosystem. Um, and then, of course, the support therapy, support groups, and there's variations in support groups in the structure and the composition, the format. And COVID has really taught us that support can be given in any, every, in any way. Previously, we used to always think that support had to be face-to-face. We needed to be there physically to be able to hold someone's hand or to give them a hug. Um, and we've realized that, no, that's not necessary anymore. You know, support can be given virtually. It can be given in so many different ways. Um, and so in, in that sense, COVID has broken a few chains um, within the support models that we have. It's shown us that, you know, we can, support can be provided in so many different ways and be equally effective in so many different ways. And there's evidence that yes, support groups make a difference, not just to the quality of life, but to treatment outcomes as well. So it's really, really important that 
people are not bereft of support, that they are provided support um, throughout the cancer journey. So I've just got a few minutes left, so I'm just gonna quickly go through what NCSM provides. So as, as mentioned by Dr. Young, we have three pillars, educate, care and support. Um, so educate is more the health education aspect of it. Care is giving um, physical um, or medical um, services and support is, as I mentioned before, support can be medical as well as community support. So with educate, um, when it comes to cervical cancer, what we try to do is to break that stigma. And how do we break that stigma is to increase the literacy on HPV infections and what it means, you know, how common it is and, and that no one should blame themselves or others in terms of getting a HPV infection and or it leads to cancer or if it leads to cancer. So we have um, health education and talks, education materials, um, and advocacy as well. I think it's very important to have advocacy. Um, what we have seen in other countries, especially, you know, as I mentioned before, in India, Nepal, and in African countries, et cetera, that someone with an HPV infection, someone with cervical, um, cervical cancer actually has increased harassment um, from society because of the linkages um, to a STI. Um, which leads to abuse, it leads to self-isolation. So it's very important that advocacy and social movement um, is strong when it comes to cervical cancer. We give all these different talks. Um, they're mostly on online webinars like today um, and on different aspects of it, on, on treatment, on screening, on survivorship, you know, fight, thrive and survive. Um, we have amazing, amazing um, talks and webinars and sessions and forums, et cetera, et cetera, on survivorship. So, you know, just join us on, on Facebook and, and all the different social medias, et cetera, or just give us a call and we can give you all the things which are coming up. Care is really, as I, I mentioned before, is the, the medical aspects of what we do. So we have diagnostic um, services, um, but what we also provide is medical counseling. Like um, there's myself, there's Dr. Morelli, there are other doctors who actually can sit with a, with a person with cancer. So after you've been diagnosed with cancer, you've seen your doctor and you've got these sheaths of paper, which gives you all the investigations, all the results, et cetera, et cetera, which really to, to most people is gibberish. You know, you don't understand um, what's on those pieces of paper and you don't understand why, you know, a doctor might have said, this is the type of treatment I want to give you. But when you see someone else who might have had cervical cancer or a friend who had cervical cancer, they have a different type of, of treatment. And you're wondering, why is it different? You know, what, you know why is mine this and there's that? Um, and for some people, that makes them lose a little bit of confidence in terms of, you know, the treatments which are in front of them. They might lose confidence in their doctor, et cetera, et cetera. So this is where we step in. And this is where we're here to help in the sense that we can go through the results with you. We can go through those sheets of paper with you. We can explain to you without that pressure that you know, a patient is waiting outside you know, to see the doctor, so I can't ask any questions sort of thing. Um, because we can spend, I can spend three hours with you if you need three hours. I can spend two days with you if you need two days with you. Um, for you to be able to understand what you have, how it impacts, what sort of treatment, um, why these sorts of treatment are given to you. We don't give you treatment options. We don't tell you this is how you should be treated, but we give you, um, we give you answers that you might want have wanted to ask your doctors, um, but didn't have the time to. We give you questions that you might be able to ask your doctor so you have a better understanding of the treatments which are being provided to you. So that's medical counseling. It's increasing your own health literacy to empower individualized decision-making. And what we do as well is that we help you navigate. So, you know, if you need treatments or you need investigations done, we will help link you up with different hospitals or different centers so that you can have those investigations done in a timely manner. 
So we have a clinic called the Cancer Health Screening Clinic, which we do all these different screenings, um, female screenings, et cetera. I'm not going to go through it. You can see it on the website. We also have a nuclear medicine center, which is a referral center for further investigations of bone scans, et cetera, et cetera. And what we have here as well is a patient assistance program. So if a doctor has given you a certain treatment, which is not available, say, in a government hospital, or a doctor in a private center has given you a certain treatment ex as well, which is incredibly expensive, um, we might be able to navigate the system for you. And we can purchase it for you at um, a lower price because we don't have to mark up. Um, like certain um, private hospitals and for government hospitals that don't offer the patients. Um, we can also offer you the avenue to purchase um, these drugs. And lastly, support. And support, as it, it states here, ensuring no journey is made alone. So at whatever point you require assistance, whatever point that you feel bereft and you need help, we are here for you. We have the resource and wellness center. We have psychosocial support. We have cancer information. Um, so we do amazing work, um, you know, and I, I'm so proud of National Cancer Society in this, in, in that they have the depth and the width of the services that we provide people. Um, so you have supporting those affected. When we say those affected, we're talking about the patient as well as the caregiver. And we focus on the wellness, the, the holistic aspect of, of treatment. So treatment is just not giving the drugs, but it's the whole person. It's the well-being of the people. And it's all free of charge. So it's empowerment for cancer patients, survivors, the caregivers through wellness classes, workshops, help their support group. The wellness classes we have are amazing. You know, there's laughter, wellness, dance, Reiki, Chinese ink painting, yoga, qigong, um, and then we have workshops as well. And on complementary therapies, motivational coping tools, relaxation. So they're public talks, they're masterclasses as well. And we have an amazing help desk, which is run by cancer survivors themselves. Okay, so you can, anytime you can walk into our center and there might be someone there you can talk to about your cancer. And we have support groups, um, specifically to cervical cancer. Pink Unity is all women's support group. Young Cancer Survivors Group are those who are young, um, who've, who've developed cancer. Um, and there's a gynae cancer support group as well. Okay, and they do an amazing, I mean, these are fun things in terms of movie day out, you know. But, you know, sharing of information on diagnosis, treatment, I think all this is incredibly important because it looks at the, the emotional needs, your psychological needs as well, and, and finding your, your identity again post a cancer diagnosis. Um, and this is Pink Unity that I mentioned. Um, yeah. And psychosocial support. So it's, it's not all about just, you know, having fun and, you know, um, it's, it's helping yourself deal with your cancer better. And so with the psychosocial support that we have in NCSM, we have um, a psychologist, a counselor, and a dietitian as well. And I will just really run through it. 1-800-88-1000 um, is our number. So we have a clinical psycho a psychology service. Um, we have uh, dietetics and nutrition service. So if you're having issues in terms of your diet, um, pre-treatment, post-treatment, um, you call us, you know, you can call us. And it's, um, it covers, you know, general information, patient support, directory, available resources, financial assistance that is required, et cetera, et cetera. And that is our number, one 800 1000 so for anything cancer related, please do call us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Santori, for your very inspiring talk. We are always so inspired and so grateful for what, what your good staff and the National Cancer Society have done for our uh, cancer support and care in the country. And thanks again, Dr. for your time with us this morning. Yeah. Most welcome. Yeah. 
Yeah, for information, Dr. will keep the Q&A session to the end of the next uh, distinguished talk. It will be very much appreciated if you can stay with us until the Thank you so much, Dr. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I'll pass back the chair to Nicole now. All right, thanks again, everyone. See you later. Once again, thank you, Dr. Dr. Sandri, for the informative talk. And also thank you, Prof. Young, for chairing this session. Once again, to all participants, if you have any questions for Dr. Dr. Sandri, please scan the Slido QR code being displayed now and type your questions there. The questions will be answered later during the Q&A session. Now, to invite our next distinguished speaker, I would like to call upon Dr. Sapna Patil, Senior Lecturer in Public Health, School of Medicine, Taylor's University, to chair this next part of our symposium. The floor is yours, Dr. Sapna. Thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, am I audible? Uh, you're a bit soft. Okay, how about now? It's a bit better now. Okay. Thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, good morning, everyone present here. And um, it gives me great pleasure uh, to invite and to introduce Dr. Dr. Abdul Aziz, such a renowned personality, uh, to the Cervical Cancer Symposium. So I'll, I'll just introduce uh, the work of Dr. Abdul Aziz. He, he is a great person and he has got a lot of experience, but in this short amount of time, I'll just introduce him. Uh, currently, Adatu Dr. Abdul Aziz is a consultant obstetrician and gynecological oncologist um, in private practice, attached to two premier private hospitals in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, in, the year in the year 1996, he started his private practice at at the Glen Eagles Hospital, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, in 2006, he was part of a core group of doctors appointed as advisors to Petronas, uh, the national petroleum company, in setting up of the Prince Court Medical Center in Kuala Lumpur. And once the center was operational, he was appointed as the head of department of obstetrics and gynecology. And he held that post for almost about six years. Now, regarding his academic uh, qualifications, he graduated from uh, the University of Malaya in the year 1982, and he became a specialist obstetrician and gynecologist in the year 1988, after obtaining his qualification from the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in London. He did spend around two and a half years at St. Mary's Hospital in London, where he undertook further training in gynecological oncology. Um, when he returned back to Malaysia in the year 1990, he worked in the academic department of the National University Hospital, and he was soon appointed uh, as an associate professor and head of the gynecological oncology department. His contributions in this field are well known in the Asia Oceanic region. He has been the past chairman of gynecological oncology committee of Asia Oceania, Oceania Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology. He has also been a board member of FIBO. Um, and he has uh, been uh, an organizing chairman of the FIBO World Congress of Obstetrics and Gynecology on several occasions. Um, he is a certified robotic surgeon and he has uh, undergone the required training and professorship in Singapore and South Korea. In fact, he performs regularly robotic-assisted gynecological surgery for both benign and malignant conditions. Um, he has been um, awarded the most esteemed order of distinguished service in the year 2007, which carries the title Datu by His Royal Highness, the King of Malaysia, for his contribution in the medical arena. With this introduction to everyone present here, I would hereby like to welcome Dr. Dr. Abdul Aziz to deliver a talk on prevention, screening, and treatment of cervical cancer. Thank you very much, Dr. for your presence. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I hope um, you can hear me clearly. Um, uh, uh, it's always a difficulty when we do a uh, Zoom webinar, you just make sure that people can hear you, you know? You can, right? Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear okay. you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to uh, Taylor's University and the team under Prof Ganesh for uh, inviting me to speak to you. 
uh, about this particular topic that is obviously close to the heart of many of us who look after women and ensuring that they remain healthy throughout their life cycle. I've been asked to speak about prevention, uh, screening, and treatment of cervical cancer. Um, you know, I, I did speak to uh, Prof. Ganesh the other day. I said that nowadays the concept has changed slightly. We're not talking about prevention anymore. We're talking about uh, elimination of cancer to cervix, if, that, if at all possible. I suppose that's, that's why we are here today on the 17th of November. But that seemed to be the anniversary when WHO announced it in the past about trying to eliminate cancer, cervical cancer more specifically in women. And um, I, I don't have that many uh, photos to show you, but I'll really be talking on concept and topics. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Now, it is well known that cancer of the cervix mainly caused by the human papilloma virus more specifically the high risk type which is 16 and 18. Now when I was a medical student way back in the 70s uh, most medical textbook would write uh, as the herpes virus as the cause of cervical cancer. Now some of you may still have some of this textbook that that sort of mentioned that in the past but now we know in the past 15 years or so more than 15 years now that the primary cause, the majority of cancer of the cervix are the high-risk human papilloma virus. And there are, there, there's a few of them, but the commonest that are high-risk are 16, 18, 45, 42, 55, 50, and 58. Now, the, uh, as I said, that the, um, in since 2018, WHO has developed a strategic plan um, in trying to eliminate cervical cancer. We have not been successful uh, in preventing it. So I thought it's very brave of the world body to actually decide that instead of continuing to uh, screen, but to go ahead and try to prevent it. And I think it is possible now with the invention and the discovery of the, uh, the cause of the cancer and also the development of the vaccine that we, we will talk later. And in the year 2020 and 17 November, I think the WHO has announced that they're committed to eliminate cancer of the cervix in the world. Now, by definition, uh, when we talk about elimination, we are, it is defined as having four cases per 100 women per year. Since difficult to achieve, but I'm sure with the strategic plan, which you're going to see later on, it is doable especially in a country, a small country like us in Malaysia. Um, there are three pillars towards achieving the elimination of cervical cancer. Um, one of which is the main important one is vaccination. Now, 20, 30 years ago, vaccination for cervical cancer wasn't in the picture, but it is now. And um, by the, you know, WHO feel that if we can achieve a vaccination of 90% of girls by the age of 15 years, is one of the pillars that will go towards eliminating cancer of the cervix. The other pillar is screening. Now, most of us understand pap smear. Now, pap smear has been done religiously year in, year out but we do realize that he has not been able to reduce the incidence of cervical cancer, far less in achieving the elimination of cancer on the surface of, of Earth, you know, especially getting a, a case of four per 100,000 per, per year. The screen has been done. In some countries, they are even better than us. You know, in Malaysia, it, I, was, I must say it is still ad hoc. We do not have a proper screening program women come for pap smear as and when they like. Uh, sometimes doctors or so are, are, responsible, are not responsible enough to actually um, insist on their ladies who are sexually active to do a regular pap smear. Now, in many countries, we feel that doing the conventional pap smear or the cervical cytology may not be the best way to achieve 
uh, uh, elimination of cancer or cervical cancer. And you'll see later uh, how, how they're doing this in Australia and they are going towards achieving eliminations uh, figure. Now, the, uh, the third pillar is treatment. Now, you and I know that different countries, different area have different uh, access to medical care, such as uh, proper gynecological surgery, chemotherapy or radiotherapy. It also depend on the, I would say the economic health of the country. Some country have very poor medical services and some are um, in the middle, Malaysia is not too bad. I think we have the whole uh, spectrum of uh, treatment modalities uh, to be offered to our patient with cervical cancer. Now, we, we spoke about vaccination just now. Um, ne next slide, please. Um, currently, currently, you know, there are 11 and 10 countries that have introduced vaccination to girls below the age of 15. Not bad. Uh, of course, uh, you know, it can be better for us to achieve elimination. I think that every country in this world should adhere to the vaccination program as proposed by WHO. Now, uh, in Malaysia at the moment, and in a government school, we are giving it to all girls uh, the minute they reach the age of 13. And uh, we we'll try to catch it up if they, they can't complete the vaccine by the age of 15. So we are on target, but we're only giving to girls. Now, in, in certain countries, they include boys. My son, you know, I, I give it to him uh, because I think it's better to protect the boys as well. So in 40 countries in this world, they also give to boys. And I think if you were to understand the pathology of the disease, you know that boys give to the girls, I think equally better if we can vaccinate both sexes when, while they're in school. I think Australia is one of the country to introduce a uh, uh, national immunization program among school kids in the year 2007. I think Malaysia did that about two or three years later, if I'm not mistaken. We launched the vaccine during the World Congress in Kuala Lumpur in the year 20, uh, 2006. That was a time when Gadasil came out first and we launched it in Kuala Lumpur Convention Center during the World Congress. And uh, our society, the OGSM, uh, we were very uh, insistent that it should be included in the national immunization program. And eventually we were able to do so uh, with a lot of help and input from our uh, pediatric uh, colleague as well. So now it is available. Now we do know that majority of countries that introduce HPV vaccination into their program will achieve a good reduction of cancer of the cervix and pre-cancer. Now, 60% of new cases these days occur in countries that do not offer uh, vaccination for H against HPV on a mass scale, countries like China and India. Now, they contribute to a huge numbers in population uh, globally. So unless we get these two nations, large nation, to be able to offer that to their populace, it's going to be difficult to achieve the figure that we think we, we are, that are achievable. Um, now, the two common, um, there's only two um, HPV vaccines available. Next slide, please. Um, I think the first one that came out was Gadasil and subsequently Sovarix. Uh, Gadasil by MSD and Sovarix by GSK. Um, currently, as far as I know, Sovarix is utilized or used mainly uh, for the National Immunization Program and Gadasil is available to the rest of the populace in Malaysia. And Gadasil has improved a lot more and they come up with the latest one called Gadasil 9 that actually uh, protects you against nine of the oncogenic HPV uh, uh, human papillomavirus. Uh, unfortunately, it's rather costly and pricey. And uh, nowadays, you can take the vaccinations uh, even up to the age of 45 or 50. And uh, we think that it's going to give you lifelong protections. And uh, the first cohort that was given the vaccine uh, in the US was in the year 2000. They've been follow up. They still have sufficient um, immunity against the virus after all these years. So we feel that a booster may not be required uh, as far as vaccines are concerned. Um, 
The next pillar is screening. Next slide, please. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, a couple of minutes ago, the commonest screening method is cytology. All of us do that. Uh, there are two methods. One is this, the conventional smear on the glass slide, and the more accurate one in terms of pickup rate is the thin prep, where it's liquid based, where we smear the, we collect the cervical mucus and transfer into a, a, a container containing liquid, and that apparently give a better pickup rate. Now, but if the pap smear has been, um, what shall we say, adequate and successful in trying to reduce the incidence of bio cancer, he hasn't achieved so. The number is escalating, the number is getting higher, and uh, this is, as you know, it's multifactorial because number one, vaccination is not uh, done uh, uh, enough, and uh, smears are not done enough. And um, so maybe we thought that the barrier that prevents people from getting pap smear is sometimes difficult to remove. Maybe we should do something less frequent, but more accurate. This is where now we're talking about doing a five-yearly HPV screen, because we do know the majority of cervical cancer is caused by the oncogenic virus. So why don't we just look for them? And we don't have to do this once uh, ever so often, because it's difficult for some of these women to come and, and make themselves accessible to the care that we want to offer. So therefore, therefore we do a five yearly screening. You know? So in your lifetime, perhaps you don't need that many screening, perhaps about, well, most about uh, five to six times, for example, in your lifetime in your reproductive age group. And it's possible to do HPV screening by self collection, uh, especially in women who have a difficulty coming to see a doctor. We can actually uh, teach them by videos or by a, uh, a pamphlet about how to do a self collection. All these, we hope, will improve the uh, accessibility to women to be screened. Now, uh, some of you may be familiar with the COMPASS trial in New South Wales in, uh, in Australia, where in the year 2014, I think they completed the trial, where it shows that they have significantly reduced cancer and improve the pickup rate by doing this staff collection HPV screen. They move away from com the conventional cytology. And I think going by that, Australia may be the first country that I can, and that I can see who will be able to achieve elimination maybe in the next decade because their pickup rates are a bit better. Early treatment has been offered to, the, to this patient when they have pre-cancer lesion, not at cancer level. So, so if you are screened regularly, either by cytology or by the HPV genotyping, the risk of dying is reduced by 87%. Because most of the time, the, the pickup rate is at the precancerous level. And you don't die from precancerous level. You know? So uh, we should strongly uh, sort of, uh, as a team of uh, caregiver uh, related to the women's health, we'll, we'll have to keep on knocking on the door, saying that maybe we should change the way we do our screening now, in Malaysia especially, uh, maybe we should consider moving away from the usual conventional cytology, which has not been very useful in reducing numbers, to the uh, five-yearly HPV screening. I, I, I think this is the way we should be. It's not a matter of copying, but I think people have done and show that it's going to be useful, costs will be reduced, not only that, cost of care will be reduced as well because it's more expensive to look after cancer than a pre-cancerous uh, patient. Um, next slide will be... Now, why is it so difficult to get women to do pap smear? I mean, as a doctor, I always wonder why. And, uh, but then if you look into the detail, there are a lot of barriers, you know? And uh, often it's the lack of knowledge. Now, somebody will say that it is impossible in this modern day where uh, information is at your fingertip, you know, everybody has smartphones these days, you know. So I wonder, you know, how much the lack of knowledge play a role here? Or is it a lack of inertia or trying to help yourself? But it's a bit of both, you know. But still, when you ask a patient sometimes, sitting in front of you that has been diagnosed with established cancer, 
sometimes they do tell you, I have no idea this can be screened. So you, you wonder where the gap is, where we have faltered in getting this information across to our patients, both men and women. I mean, husbands sometimes can be useful partner in trying to encourage their ladies to come for a screen. But sometimes the husband himself are a bit ignorant about the possibility of screening. The other thing, of course, um, when to start a pap smear. Now, this is a disease that is associated with the virus, therefore associated with promiscuity. Uh, well, that's a concept. That is the general thinking of people who refuse, I think, to be able to comprehend the fact that we are human. Sexual activities is part and parcel of life cycle. We cannot you know, prevent people from having intercourse. Uh, and the, this is one condition where some people or so some group may associate it with promiscuity. Now, I see patients all the time. Some are single women, and they need to be truthful to you to see whether they're sexually active. Because if they are, they need to do a pap smear within the first year of starting intercourse, what we call coiter care. Uh, so the minute you uh, have start sexual activity, regardless of your marital status, you should do a pap smear. Um, that is a, the, if, if you don't have HPV screen as yet. Um, so the concept, I think, among the general populace, among people of, of, of importance that can lead the way, the NGOs, should take away the concept of sex promiscuity in the equation of this cancer. We need to do that. Now, sometimes patients say, well, I don't want to do it anymore because the last time I had it was so difficult. It was so unpleasant. It was so painful. The doctor wasn't, or the person was doing it for me, the doctors or the nurse wasn't gentle enough. And I think that's going to be repeated every year if I were to do it. It's painful. I don't like it. Um, yes, uh, people who are in the, in the business of doing this test should be taught properly or how to do it, uh, not only the proper way of doing it, but the proper way of communicating to the patient while doing it uh, and using uh, the proper instruments. You know, I think we should move away from the metal speculum. All of us should be doing the plastic, single-use disposable speculum, uh, and, which is more gentle with a lot of lubrications. But I think communication prior to doing the test is important. Um, from my experience, I think, yes, some patients will say that, yes, I had an unpleasant one, but this is not too bad, it's bearable, so I don't mind coming again. So it is, a, I would think, it's a very personal approach from the caregiver to the patient to ensure that the patient keep on coming back annually for the test. Of course, the last one is actually fear, you know. Uh, people don't want to be screened because they're worried about knowing the, a positive report. You know, the, the fear of the procedure is one, and the fear of the result is the other. And, <laughs> but I think it's better to know what you have than not to know and ignore it. It won't go away. It just keep on growing. You know? Next slide, please. Okay, who are the underserved? I mean, we don't have to look very far. In our own backyard, there are a lot of groups that have not have access to proper care. Not just in gynecology, not just doing a pap smear, <clears throat> but also general healthcare, uh, the healthcare in general, pediatric care, geriatric care, you know, that kind of thing. But certainly, uh, economic wealth, economic prosperity is closely linked to having an equitable uh, distribution of health services. Um, but there are a lot of NGOs, there are a lot of associations that go down to the ground to help out these uh, rather unfortunate folks. Uh, so unless we address this in a very serious way, it's going to be difficult to get these people to have access to the screening services. Some of you have worked in rural and remote areas. You know, uh, women are so dependent on the family to help them to get to a center to be seen by a doctor or a gynecologist or a trained uh, nurse for a pap smear. Uh, that's reality. Uh, maybe it's not too bad in uh, East Malaysia, but if some of you have worked in the, uh, 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 West Malaysia, I mean, if some of you have worked in East Malaysia, uh, Sabah, South Sarawak, you will know that assess is rather difficult. There are women in very remote areas. 
Cultural sensitivity is one more. The other thing, you know, there's many cultures in Malaysia. <laughs> we, are, we are famous for that. Uh, but we are also famous for the fact that some, some are real taboos, you know, to talk about sex, to talk about health related to your reproductive organs, talking about illnesses that can be, uh, that can occur in your uh, private parts. These are all taboo. I've seen many cases of women who have cancer or cervix who are disabled, they are in wheelchairs. You know, they are actually, some of them are actually bedridden from a, a, another illness, but not knowing that there's something growing inside them. So disability, uh, physical disability is another factor that, that contribute to these people being underserved as far as care is concerned. <clears throat> um, so, so that's some, the, the, I have covered the, the two main pillars. Now the third pillar is, as I said, the treatment. Now, I, it's a very simplified slide. I just said, you know, I just want to talk about pre-cancer deletion and the treatment for them and the treatment for cancer. You know, not the very detail, but just touching over the fact that, you know, when you do a pap smear, you must know the report, the result. You know, unfortunately, I hate to say this, many a time a woman will attend to a, a, a government clinic, for example, had the smear test done, they have no idea whether the report is abnormal or normal. I'm not too sure whether anyone will see the report and call the patient when the report is abnormal. When you clock a patient of can with a confirmed cancer sitting in front of you, you ask them, they say, yeah, I did my pet smear two years ago. Do you know the report? No, I do not know. Often. So, the, the call and recall system is so crucial. You know, when you do a test, you must know the report. Okay, if the report is normal, you, you, you perhaps you come back one or two years later for another cervical cytology. But when the report is abnormal, you should be referred to a gynecologist who is trained to do what we call a corposcopic examination. Now, for the benefit of the rest who do not know about corposcopy, it is simple binocular. So I will explain to my patient what this test. You know, we had to do a corposcopy examination and the doctors who are, who's doing it must be trained in it. It's not just shining a camera into the cervix and figure out what you're looking at. You must be trained. Now corposcopy is the first approach when you have an abnormal pap smear mimicking pre-cancer solution. We need to confirm first. Cancer of the cervix doesn't happen overnight. It's not something like that. No, yesterday you didn't have cancer and today you developed cancer. It went through a pre-cancerous stage, what we call the CIN, cervical intraepicular neoplasia, which is generally speaking divided into three, CIN 1, 2, and 3. Now, from CIN 1 to get to CIN 3, if you were to progress, it may take about 10 years, All right? And from CIN1 to CIN3 to become cancerous, it may take another five years. So it shows to you that you have about 10, 15 years to be discovered at the pre-cancerous level and get treated and don't get cancer. So when I see a patient with cancer, I know there's a failure in the train of services that has been provided. Patient may be at fault for not doing the pet smear. She did her smear, no one told her the report, for example. She didn't know she had it. And she thinks, I only need to do a pet smear once in a lifetime. Don't, don't bother to come back for repeat. Yeah? So it's a failure of the system. So when we see a, a normal smear, we do a corposcopy. And during corposcopy examination, we will map the cervix using this very fine binocular that can magnify the cervix about 50 times with a powerful light on it. And I keep on telling my patient, this instrument will not go inside you. It is outside you. I'm sitting in between your legs and examining your cervix. It can be done under anesthesia, local or general, depending on the patient's, uh, uh, you know, some patients are a bit nervous. So we have to give them a bit of anesthetic. And the, the doctor will look at the cervix carefully and find where the lesion is. And if he discovered where the lesion is, he will remove it, what we call it, what we call a cone biopsy. We just remove that portion that's abnormal. The woman will still have her cervix, her uterus, and the rest, minus 
the area of the cervix that is abnormal. What we call the uh, atypical transformation zone, showing some features of cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. That's all you need. Just having done that, come back for follow-up a week later for us to discuss the report. Now, it could be CIN 1, 2, or 3, but if we completely remove, that's the end of your treatment cycle. You need to come back for follow-up smear eventually, and the doctor will tell you so. So that's how we treat precancerous lesion. It is conservative, it's very cheap, it's very little morbidity, and patient will not have to lose her reproductive ability. Right? And then you have cancer. Not discovered. Pre-CIN lesion was not known. Progress on to become cancer. Now you have cancer. Now the treatment of cancer is surgical, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy. Immunotherapy is still uh, being uh, sort of not 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 a, a big thing in cervical cancer. Maybe a big thing in other cancer, but not in cervical cancer. As you all know, that uh, cancer of the cervix is broadly uh, divided into stage one, two, three, and four, uh, and there are some of the uh, sort of sub sub stage. Yeah, but surgically it is possible to do radical surgery for stage one and stage two. Uh, if you have more than that, if you're still amenable for surgery, the surgery becomes even more difficult to do. We call it accentrations. For stage one and two, we can do what we call radical time hysterectomy. Now, it, it is on average, when I do these cases, they about three hours to do. It's a major operation. There are a lot of mobility to, to follow sometime. There's some complication involved. And the surgery will be done in the center with full facility to support you, including ICU care, in case you need one. So that will tell you that the cost has escalated from a simple condition that we can do at, with colposcopy at a pre-cancerous level, now needing a major surgery, which, more, which costs more. So the burden care increases when you develop cancer, All right? So having done surgery, the whole lot of tissue that was removed from you, including your uterus, your cervix, your ovaries, and your limb nodes will be sent for analysis. And uh, if the limb nodes are positive, for metastasis, you need more treatment after surgery, such as chemotherapy or radiotherapy, right? So why do we need to come to that? You know, I think uh, I, I look on, on a day when, you know, no, nobody will need this radical surgery that give a lot of side effect, complication rates, and even death on time, uh, when we can actually treat it before it becomes cancerous, all right? And I'm just repeating myself here. I'd say that every time I see a patient with spinal cancer, I realize there's a failure in the system. And the failure can be uh, rectified if all stakeholders like us, people like us, uh, understand the pathology, understand perhaps what we've been doing all these years are not sufficient to reduce and achieve a figure of four per 100,000 women per year. Talking about elimination just now. If you feel that it's not possible, Perhaps we should have to relook really at our strategy. And I think the change strategy is, is unavoidable. And I think countries that will show a better uh, outcome for care of their patients need not be rich, but need to have uh, the stakeholder being very dogmatic about delivering the kind of service that women require. And I think we in the front line should start thinking about maybe we should start changing uh, how we do a pap smear now, you know, because we know it's difficult for people to come every year. Perhaps we should now consider doing mass screening for HPV. We have to deal with the, uh, the connotation that come with a positive HPV, for example. If you are dealing with a couple who has the HPV positive, you know, the first response, they look at each other and say, who's responsible? <laughs> uh, all, the, all those issues we have to address, but I think if you're dealing with a very um, uh, adult population, I think it's a bit more uh, reasonable to explain to them how you get it. It's always through intercourse. You know, it's nothing to do with uh, sitting on dirty toilets or eating the wrong food. You know? So my take is that it is possible, but I think we have to relook at the way we deliver our service. I think I've come to the end and I, I, I'm very happy to take any question. Thank you very much.
thank you, Dr. Dr. Abdulaziz, for the insightful sharing. Um, so, um, to the audience, just to summarize what, what Dr. Abdulaziz has shared with us, um, he has shared with us actually uh, the target for the WHO cancer cervical cancer elimination initiative of bringing out bringing the incidence of cervical cancer to less than four cases uh, per hundred thousand women per year. And he has uh, given us an elaborate description of the three pillars towards achieving the target. So he did uh, explain to us about the importance of uh, HPV vaccination, not only to girls, but to boys. But he did explain to us about the current vaccination program um, of HPV vaccination in Malaysia. Um, regarding screening, uh, he brought up an important point talking about uh, how uh, the conventional cytology uh, needs to be um, changed or replaced by the five yearly HPV screen by giving us an example of the COMPASS trial, uh, which has been completed in Australia and the findings of the trial, which have been significant uh, by improving the pickup rate of HPV screening. The most important uh, aspect of his talk, which I felt today was uh, talking up to us about the barriers uh, which people face when they need to come to screening. So we all understand that it is important uh, for women to get screened for cervical cancer. However, the barriers which are uh, very uh, practical and uh, the, they are there everywhere, they are universal. So identification of those barriers and addressing those barriers with communication of the healthcare provider with the client being the most important one. So personal approach towards the clients is going to help uh, us in achieve more and more people coming forward to get screened. Of course, we need to keep in mind the cultural sensitivities. Um, yeah. Cultures do differ across countries, across different regions, and people who are providing care to those uh, people in the particular regions need to be aware of those not forgetting the underserved populations, so hard to reach populations, those living in rural and remote areas. So we talk so much about access and equity in access to healthcare and that for that cervical cancer is no exception. Um, with reference to treatment, he uh, gave us a very insightful understanding of how precancerous lesions are different from the frank cancerous lesions. So identifying the precancerous lesions with the help of the technique of colposcopy and reassuring uh, the patient or the client that this is a procedure which is going to help identify identify any kind of changes in the cervical cells uh, with the help of conization, um, with the help of conization taking uh, the transformation zone, the taking the biopsy, and that leaves the woman without any morbidity or any change in the reproductive ability. So communicating these findings uh, are of vital importance uh, when such procedures are undertaken. Uh, he has also uh, summed up uh, the various forms of treatment which are available for treatment of uh, cervical cancer. And uh, at the end of his session, what he mentioned is, um, if there are cases of cervical cancer occurring in women, he feels it is uh, a failure of the failure in the train of the services that we provide to our patients. So, if we are able to identify the gap, if we are able to identify the links in this uh, train, which we can change or which we can modify, so that we relook into our approach, better outcomes can be achieved. So, thank you very much, Dr. Abdulaziz, for your insightful sharing. Thank you. Over to you, Nico. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Abdulaziz, as well as thank you, Dr. Sakna, for chairing this session. We have now come to the Q&A session. To post your questions for Dr. Dr. Soundary and Dr. Dr. Aziz, please scan the slider QR code that is being displayed now on the screen and you may type your questions there. You can choose to reveal your name or remain anonymous. With that, I will now pass the floor to our Q&A session moderator, Dr. Punita Vati, Senior Lecturer in Family Medicine, Taylor University, Clinical Medicine, Malaysia. Over to you, Dr. Punita. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I'm sure everyone agrees with me that we've had such an insightful morning today with both our distinguished um, lecturers. Um, for those who have just joined us, with us today are Dr. Dr. Soundari Somasundram, who's the President and Medical Director of National Cancer Society, 
and Dr. Dr. Abdul Aziz Yahya, who is a consultant obstetrician and gynecological oncologist from Glen Eagles and Prince Cop Medical Center. So um, now we will have a 15 minutes Q&A session. So for those of you who still would want to post your questions, you may do so while I go through the questions with the, our speakers today. Um, so to start the ball rolling, um, the first question that has been posted today um, is, Doctor, could you share with us something about cervical cancer rates, survival rates, and how mental and social impact uh, affects cervical cancer patient. I think Dato Dr. Sondri did cover some of this in her lecture. Uh, Dato, would you want to elaborate a little bit more? Thank you. Um, in terms of um, cervical cancer survival rates, as, as Dr. Aziz mentioned before, um, unfortunately in, in Malaysia, um, there is still hesitancy in terms of coming up with diagnosis. Of, of cervical cancer. And um, the majority of cervical cancer are already found in stage three, stage four, um, and not in early stages as we would like. Because of that, our survival rates are quite low. Um, they're lower than the global average for cervical cancer. So um, the mental and social impacts are similar to other, to other cancers um, in the sense that there is a, with cancer, um, as you know, there's, there's still a stigma associated with cancer. And when I talk about stigma associated with cancer, it's not just on the social aspects of cancer, but you're talking about the economic aspects as well. So for um, women who have been successfully treated for uh, cervical cancer or other cancers, to go back to the workplace is um, fairly difficult in many instances, especially if um, you work for a Malaysian company um, compared to a multinational company or within the government. Actually, the government sector is uh, excellent when it comes to looking after their, their um, employees uh, when it comes to cancer. However, for uh, small businesses in Malaysia, many of um, cancer survivors do not get their jobs back within the community. And once you want to go back into a new job, um, Having to, having to actually state that you are a cancer survivor can be very restrictive um, in terms of acquiring that job. So um, economically, it is very difficult. Um, socially as well, as I mentioned before, you know, the emotional impact is even more when it comes with cervical cancer, especially, and, and Dr. Oz has mentioned this as well, because of relationship issues. Um, so we need to be supportive and we need to be able to support just not the person with cancer, but the, the spouse as well, to ensure that that relationship between husband and wife or you know, partner um, stays strong um, and that mental well-being um, continues. Thank you, Dr. Sandri. Um, we'll just move on to the next question. Um, this, I think there are a couple of questions um, directed your side. Um, the first one is from uh, Prof. Dr. Abdul Karim. Uh, what is the current status of Cervarix in Malaysia? Um, does it only prevent um, cancers caused by HPV type 16 and 18? And how do we ensure prevention of other types of HPV? That one I will leave to Dr. Aziz. Yeah, I, I have direct <laughs> that to Dr. Aziz. Yes, that's right. Um, he did cover that in his lecture, though. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's all right. I thought I can expand it a bit further because there's a, a time constraint in the in the main lecture just now. Now, currently, Savaric is being utilized for the national immunization program. So I think it is not available for the general populace. They are just concentrating on giving it to school girls. Um, yes, Sabari uh, is designed to prevent type 16 and 18, whereas Gadasil is uh, both uh, 16 and 18 and 11 and 13 as well, that prevent uh, the, uh, the papilloma virus, the benign one, yeah? So it cover both, uh, Gadasil cover both the oncogenic and the, the one that caused the ward viruses. Now, there's a lot of cross protection here. The majority of cervical cancer is caused by 16 and 18. But they also, cervarix provide cross protection against the other strain as well. And that has already been proven about a decade ago when they did a lot of studies on these two particular products. So I think we have moved away from that. Uh, it does protect. But you see, 
my word of caution is doesn't mean you have been protected, you've been vaccinated. Perhaps I missed that point just now, that you can stop undergoing regular screening, uh, screening for, for cancer. You must continue to do cervical cytology, pap smear or HPV screening, you know, uh, even though you've been vaccinated. Vaccination of uh, this doesn't mean you are protected 100% from getting cancer. A small percentage of cervical cancer are not related to the virus, right? 70% of this cancer of the cervix is related to the virus. The other 30% may not be. So there are other variety that can come arise, that can, can arise de novo without any input from the virus. Okay, thank you, Datuk. Um, there are two more questions uh, for Datuk Aziz. Um, what is the best treatment plan once diagnosed with cervical cancer? And there has also been some interest to know uh, about your experience with robotic assisted, um, assisted gynecological um, surgery. Could you do share with us uh, a little bit on that? Uh, yeah, of course I can. I'm happy to do so. And now, uh, there's no such thing as what's the best treatment plan. We all depend on the stage of cancer. If you are in an early stage, but you have other so many medical comorbid comorbidities, you will not be able to survive surgery. Even though the best treatment is for early stage is surgery, the patient has to be fit for surgery, right? So that's how I want to answer this. You know, the best plan of care is not only depend on the stage of the disease, also dependent on the patient's well-being and ability to undergo through surgery, for example. I have cases whereby the patient stage 1B is a good case for radical surgery, but she just recovered from a heart attack, she had a stroke, for example, she's morbidly obese, her diabetes is over the roof, so we might as well send her for radiotherapy. So the plan will depend on proper assessment of the patient's conditions, assessment of a cancer, and doing necessary investigation, then we come up with the best plan. You know, I, I hope that that clarified the point. Yeah, basically, yeah. Um, you're um, saying individualized treatment, yeah. Exactly, thank you very much. Yeah, we had to individualize it. Now, as far as robotic surgery is concerned, uh, many of you may have come across the, uh, the finding of the LAC study, laparoscopic surgery in cervical cancer that discouraged the use of keyhole surgery, whether laparoscopic or robotics, for cancer of the cervix. Robotic surgery, which I do a lot in uh, the, the hospital that I work, is excellent for endometrial cancer, where the resource, which is different, endometrial cancer is in the endometrium in the uterus, so bio cancer is the cervix. So endometrial cancer tend to occur in the women in the menopausal age group, for example, and cervical cancer tend to occur in the more much younger women. So they're quite different. Yeah? Yes, we do robotic surgery, but not recommended for cervical cancer. So surgeons themselves have to know the limitation of their skill. They also have to know the limitation of this, the technique that they're going to offer to the patient. In the past, there are some centers who are promoting doing robotic surgery for all cancer, except ovarian cancer. But then they realized that the chance of the survival rates are slightly lesser among women who have survival cancer treated robotically or minimally by minimally invasive surgery, meaning robotic or laparoscopic. Yes, I do a lot of robotic. I'm not going to promote it here. But yes, I choose my patient carefully who will be uh, eligible, who will be an excellent candidate for robotic surgery. Despite all that, we do have a number of patients that are eligible. So it can, do, can be done, but not for cervical cancer. Thank you, Tato. I think the message was clear on that. Um, Dato, Dr. Sondri, there's another question on how can we help patients so affected by their cancer experience that they suffer from post-traumatic stress and um, constant anxiety? Okay. Um, firstly, in, in terms of, of effect of the cancer experience, as I mentioned before, the effect of the cancer experience can be immediate but the effect of the cancer experience can only have, you know, for some happen three, five, 10 years later. Um, so the important aspect here, I think, is to ensure that whoever has cancer um, is supported throughout their journey. And as I mentioned, you know, survivorship is to the end of life. Um, specifically, those who we know who are affected by the cancer experience, 
is to provide them with that support. And that support can vary depending on how bad um, they are affected by the cancer. The support can vary from um, professional help um, or just having peer or community help or having a mixture of both. So the first thing is um, to be assessed, um, to see how much that impact is. And so with something like that, you know, um, as I mentioned, you, you can come to NCSM, we have a psychologist, we have doctors available to be able to sit down and talk to you. Um, there's peer support groups there as well. And um, with the psychologist there and, and the doctors there, we can actually assess in terms of how much help you require. How bad is that post-traumatic uh, uh, stress? How bad is that anxiety? Um, will it need um, clinical assistance or a holistic uh, measure looking at it is, is good enough? Meaning that, you know, with peer support, with complementary therapies, et cetera, et cetera, we're able to alleviate that anxiety which is felt. And I think a lot of anxiety which is, um, which is linked to um, cervical cancer, um, one is that feeling of isolation, feeling that nobody, you know, that people might not understand what your cancer is about, because again, it is, um, there's a sexual connotation to it. Um, and having that realization that you are not alone in that, that, that there are other people who have gone through the same experience and there are other people who have, um, there, are, there are ways and interventions um, available to help you manage it. Um, whether it's the emotional aspect of it or the physical impact of the cancer itself or the treatment. Thank you, Dr. Sondri. Um, we have got a few more questions, but as we are running out of time, I will just summarize some of the questions. Um, there are three questions which are linked to HPV infection. Um, it um, states that HPV infection does not equate to cervical cancer and long persistent infection would then lead to cancer. And um, this, uh, so the question wants to know if it would still be relevant to do pap smear screening instead of replacing it with HPV tests. Um, Dr. Aziz, could you please help us on that? And um, there is also another question on a new uh, PET type HPV cell sampling kit. Could you just share with us some um, ideas on this? The first one first, the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with this particular brand, but there are a lot of uh, kit in the market that can be in the sent over by post to a lady who wants to do self-sampling and there had to be a center to collect it. I'm not too sure whether the collection uh, train system in Malaysia is, is well placed to be able to do self-sampling as yet. Uh, so that is still, I think, need to be looked at. I'm sure any kit is equally good as long as they're you know, allow women to sample themselves easily. Now, uh, the, the, the question about whether there is a need to do screening because some, since some cancers are not related to HPV, it's not a, uh, it, it is a true statement because not all cervical cancer is caused by virus, as I said just now. You see, when you do, this is where I think we need to get it right. When you do a pap smear, you are not just doing a pap smear you are doing a vaginal examination as well. Meaning when you sample the cervical mucus from the cervix, you should visualize the cervix, right? So when you do a pap smear, if, if there is early can, uh, lesion there, if you don't look, you may miss. We have had cases whereby a pap smear is normal even though the patient has frank cancer. It's sampling error. We know that there are sampling error involved here, right? So. The whole idea is trying to eliminate cancer. Majority are still HPV related. So I think screening is beyond discussion, is a necessity, right? And a proper examination of the cervix while sampling add on further uh, 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 accuracy to your assessment of the cervix. And I think that should go hand in hand. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Aziz. Um, there are a few more questions which actually look at the um, economic aspects and uh, financial uh, feasibility um, in the um, strategy to overcome or eradicate cervical cancer. So um, they wanted your comments on how to overcome these financial um, um, challenges in the fight to eradicate cervical cancer. This question was from Dr. Subhash Patel. Uh, well, you know, I, I like to answer this in a very simplistic way. You know, it's, it's going to be difficult. That's why I thought it was very brave for WHO to come up 
with that statement, elimination of cancer, achieving four per 100,000 women per year, knowing very well that there's uh, maldistribution of wealth, you know, access to health globally. Unless you address all that, you're not going to achieve that. So every country, I think, has to understand the concept that if we were to go, I mean, we talk about previously 10 years ago, we we're talking about Millennium Development Goal number four. Have we achieved any of that? Zero. I don't think we did. But again, like this concept, you have to look at every country on their own. The political will, the funding must come. Without all that, it is just a discussion that we have, a feel good factor, and we all go home and we say we set out a map, uh, uh, the, the map, the uh, plan, but it's not doable. So I, my suggestion is that we all have to look, we have to push our political leaders to create more funding, to have better access. We say that all the time. It's difficult. But if we don't, we provide all that. Women themselves has to come in, have to come in for the test. If I have all the excellent infrastructure, but you refuse to see me or come and see your test, nothing much we can do about it. Can I interject there as well? I mean, I, I think the last... Um... The last point that uh, Dr. Aziz made is that one is that you can have as sophisticated diagnostic or services available, et cetera, et cetera, but people have to come to it. And we need to get down to the bottom of why people are not coming to do their tests. And that is community. Um, that is just not government led. That is community led as well. If we do not change um, the picture around cervical cancer, if we do not change that idea and that stigma which is associated with cervical cancer, you can have the best screening programs available, um, but people are not going to come forward. Um, so this is where I urge, you know, tailors and, and other communities to start talking about cervical cancer, to start talking um, about it openly and freely, um, having discussions about uh, sexually transmitted diseases, having discussions about um, not just women, but the role of men and women together um, in acquiring HPV infections um, and, and decreasing that stigma which is associated with HPV. Thank you very much, Dr. Sondre. I think that was very well said. Um, we would like to thank both our speakers today for their time and input. I think it has been such an insightful morning. And um, one message is clear. It takes a collective effort on all parts of society to completely eradicate cervical cancer. Thank you again, Dr. Dr. Sondri and Dr. Dr. Abdul Aziz. Thank you very much. And thank you participants. Please enjoy the remaining of the conference and I pass it over to Nicole. Thank you, everyone. Thank you everyone for your active participation. It's a bit great to see everyone asking and learning so much. Also, thank you, Dr. Kinita. Now, Everyone, please sit back and relax as we watch a short video presentation prepared by Taylor's University medical students to raise awareness and support for the Cervical Cancer Elimination Initiative. Cervical cancer is the growth of a mass at the neck of the cervix. Although it is preventable, it is still the fourth most common cancer among women. Most women are at risk for cervical cancer and it occurs most often in those over the age of 30. In 2018, an estimated 570,000 women were diagnosed with cervical cancer worldwide and there were about 311,000 deaths. Nearly 90% of deaths in 2018 occurred in low- and middle-income countries where the burden of cervical cancer is the greatest. And this is due to limited access to public health services and the lack of implementation of screening and treatment. The major risk factor of cervical cancer is HPV infection. Almost all cervical cancer cases are linked to an infection of high-risk HPV. Other risk factors include using birth control pills for more than 5 years, 3 or more full-term pregnancies, tobacco smoking, having several sexual partners, having a weakened immune system, HIV infection, and other sexually transmitted infections.
How can women reduce the risk of having cervical cancer? Women should be encouraged to get vaccinated with the HPV vaccine, undergo occasional health screening such as pap smear and HPV screening test, and practice safe sex by using condoms. Getting vaccinated before becoming sexually active can prevent a person from getting the high-risk HPV types which can cause cervical cancer. Two doses of HPV vaccine should be administered to adolescent girls between the ages of 9 and 13 years as it works best if administered prior to HPV infection. Pap smear and human papilloma virus screening tests can help prevent cervical cancer. Pap smear is done to look for precancerous or cancerous cells in the cervix to determine the risks of developing cervical cancer in women, while the HPV test is to detect cervical infection by human papilloma virus. This is important because HPV infection can increase the chances of women to suffer from cervical cancer. When precancerous lesions are detected early, it is highly treatable and associated with long survival and a good quality of life. According to the World Health Organization, to successfully eliminate cervical cancer in all countries, 90% of women should be fully vaccinated with the HPV by the age of 15, 70% of women should be screened by the age of 35, and 90% of women with precancerous lesions should be treated and managed. With appropriate actions taken against the elimination of cervical cancer, we can together create a cervical cancer-free future for all. Wasn't that such an informative video? I'm sure we have all learned something from it. Next, continuing with our presentations, I would like to invite Dr. Kain Kim Pyu to chair our next session. Dr. Kain is our senior lecturer in ONG School of Medicine, Palace University, Malaysia. Over to you, Dr. Kain. Thank you so much, Nicole. A very good morning, professor, doctors, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining our second day of the Cervical Cancer Symposium in Wednesday morning. Uh, this morning, we just had a very engaging section shared by Dr. Dr. Sundri and very informative section by Dr. Dr. Abdul Azid. Now, we are going to have another interesting talk by the bright spark of our Taylor University, Dr. Peng Yvonne. Dr. Peng Yvonne is a medical graduate from our Taylor University School of Medicine. She passed her final MBBS professional exam with distinction and Dean List Award in August 2021. Dr. Yvonne had served as the president of Taylor's University Medical Society for the term 2020-2021. She has co-founded the World Platform on Instagram, where Dr. Yvonne raises health-related and psychosocial issues surrounding physical and mental health. It's because uh, Dr. Yvonne believed that education is the tool that helps to prevent diseases and reduce the fear surrounding it. Currently, she is preparing to sit for MRCOG part one in 2022 next year, as she hoped to pursue her career in obstetrics and gynecology. Dr. Pang Yvonne, uh, passion ranges from women's health, sexual health, and HIV. She desires for the young generation to take active action for their health and to eliminate the stigma surrounding sexual health education and sexually transmitted diseases. She hopes that in near future, women of all ages will be empowered by the knowledge of the body and thus be able to make informed consent about their own health. We are very honored to have Dr. Yvonne to deliver a useful talk for our society don't fear the smear. Dr. Yvonne, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the kind introduction, Dr. Kain. Um, first and foremost, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to Taylor's University School of Medicine and the chairman of the organizing committee of this webinar, uh, Prof. Ganesh, and uh, Prof. P.T. Thomas, the executive dean of Faculty of Health and Medical Science for this invitation. I am extremely humbled to have this opportunity to speak to the public uh, alongside with experienced and knowledgeable doctors in this field. And I hope that individuals who are still in doubts of getting their pap smear done will have a change of mind 
uh, after my talk. This is the reason why I've titled my talk today as Don't Fear the Smear. Uh, next. Um, so what you're seeing here is the United States stamp with the portrait of uh, Dr. George Nicholas uh, Papa Nicolau. He was given this honor because of his invention of pap smear, uh, which was named after him. He is a Greek physician that migrated to the United States. Uh, when he first arrived uh, at New York with his wife, uh, they spoke little to no English, with little money and was jobless. After a year of taking odd jobs, he was hired by New York University and Cornell University. This is where he started to study the cytopathology of human reproductive system. And this is when he discovered that he was able to spot malignant cervical cell uh, under a microscope. Pap smear is now an important tool in screening for cervical cancer because of Dr. Papa Nicolau. There's one thing undeniable regarding cervical cancer is the fear surrounding pap smear. Uh, there are myths and misunderstanding which uh, pushes women away from this simple screening procedure. And I believe that one of the ways to help reduce this fear is by introducing the equipments that are being used during a pap smear. Uh, next, please. So uh, what we are seeing here are the pap smear kit. Um, you can see the conventional kit where it involves a wooden spatula and a glass light, um, where the wooden spatula will be inserted into the vagina to reach the cervix, to obtain sample from the cervix, and the sample will be put on the glass light, which will be viewed under the microscope. While um, the blue one here you are seeing is the newer type of the pap smear kit, it is the liquid-based cytology. And the reason why this uh, kit was invented is to improve the diagnostic reliability of pap smear and to ensure that enough sample has been taken from the cervix and to minimize materials that might obstruct the view under the microscope. So it contains a brush which will be inserted into the vagina and then uh, the cervical uh, sample will be taken and the brush will then put into the bottle which contains the liquid. Next. And this is a plastic speculum. Um, many women are scared of this uh, merely because of the size and the shape. And knowing that something foreign is being inserted into your private part are worrisome for many. However, women should know that this plastic item is useful to visualize the vagina and the cervix so that the physician can identify the half of the cervix. With lubricants and water, it should cause little discomfort. Next. At the pap smear, women will be placed in this specific position. Um, and prior to that, they'll be given privacy to undress and the chaperone will be present to ensure the safety of the patient and the doctor. When the speculum is inserted, we will be able to see whether there's any abnormal opening of the cervix, any discharge or suspicious masses that requires further action. If not, pap smear will be done and this procedure should last five minutes or even lesser than that. Um, right now, I would like us to dive into the myths surrounding pap smear, and hopefully I'll be answer some of your worries. Next. So um, the first myth surrounding pap smear is that it is extremely painful. Um, however, it is not true. Stretching of the vagina by the speculum might be a little discomfort, and uh, some women does complain of uh, bleeding, a few drops of bleed, uh, blood after the pap smear, but heavy bleeding is abnormal and it should not happen. And pap smear should not cause extreme pain if done by experienced and patient gynecologists. The next one is regarding cost. Cost is one of the factors that hinder women from getting their pap smear. In private setting, a pap smear costs about 40 to 80 ringgits. Some of us can easily afford this, but not everyone is as privileged. For those who are looking for alternative, we should be thankful for a great healthcare system in Malaysia. Pap smear is for free in government hospital, and the only fees that will be involved is uh, five ringgit so that you can visit a specialist. The last myth that I'm gonna talk about is regarding HPV vaccine. Um, HPV vaccine was given for free uh, for girls who were born starting from the year uh, 1997. Uh, I was born in the year 1996, so I missed out the government rollout of the vaccine. Uh, some of the misunderstanding that my peers has um, regarding uh, HPV vaccine is that once they've had their pap smear, there's no need for cervical cancer screening. We do know that pet, uh, HPV is the leading cause of cervical cancer. And according to uh, Cancer Research UK, 
the vaccine has cut down cervical cancer uh, by almost 90%. However, as mentioned by uh, the speaker uh, prior to this, um, HPV vaccine does not target all serotype of the HPV. And some of the dangerous strand does not have the vaccine yet. Plus, not all cervical cancer are caused by the virus itself. Yeah, I don't know. Is it side of it? Next. Um, if there's one take-home message that I would like all of you to remember from my talk is that pet smears save lives. It helps us to identify precancerous changes of the cervix so that we can detect abnormal cells before they turn into full-blown cancer. And this is what we know as early detection. Next. Next slide, please. Um, so when cancer is detected earlier, um, it might be of uh, an earlier stage, meaning that the cancer might still be within the cervix and it has not spread elsewhere. Early detection allows us to have early treatment. And if the cancer is caught at the earlier stages, less aggressive proge procedures can be done to remove the cancer. And because of this, we'll have a better outcome such as complete removal of the cancer or better quality of life. Next. Um, when I was looking for content uh, for my talk, I came across this joke made by someone online. Uh, they said that they would rather get a paper cut and pour vinegar on the wound and shoot off their uh, uh, toe rather than getting their pet smear done. This is how much they are fearful of pet smear. But my advice to this individual and to all women out there is that if five minutes of discomfort um, can save your life, prolong your life, and maintain your quality of life, uh, what is your excuse for not doing it? It is time for us to take responsibility of our own body, take charge in maintaining our health physically and mentally. Next. So um, this has been discussed just now as well regarding the HPV self-sampling. So WHO has started a self-care campaign. They define self-care as the ability of individuals families and communities to promote health, prevent disease, maintain health, and to cope with illness and disability with or without the support of a healthcare provider. This means more of the patient and less of the doctor, which is why uh, WHO are encouraging women to participate in self-sampling for cervical cancer screening. Women can do this at the comfort of their home without the embarrassment of um, undressing in front of their doctors and it is cost effective. And it, is, um, and it is recommended for women who are more than 30 years, and this should be repeat every five years. And some sampling only requires a vagina swab rather than a cervical sample. So it's less aggressive and it will be painless. You can mail the sample to the lab where they will look for high-risk HPV strain. And if negative, they will repeat it after five years. And if unfortunately the sample returned with positive results, uh, the women will then be referred to a doctor for further evaluation. For more information on HPV self-testing, uh, you can look up on ROSE Foundation online. So ROSE stands for Removing Obstacle to Cervical Screening. Next. Um, as per Dr. Kai's introduction, I've co-founded a platform named The Walk Platform on Instagram. Um, the reason why my partner and I started this is because we believe that education is the most important preventive measures for diseases and illness. And through this platform, we were able to raise awareness regarding common diseases, mental health, and discuss psychosocial issues surrounding health. So do check it out and share it with your families and friends because uh, the information that we have are public friendly, meaning that we do not use uh, medical jargons on it so that the public can understand it more easier. Next. Um, coming to the end of my talk, my aim in this talk is to empower women through education. And now it is your turn. After obtaining the knowledge of the importance of pet smear and cervical screening, it is time for you to raise awareness and to spread the awareness to the ones that you love as well, so that you can empower them too. That's all from me today. Thank you for listening. And once again, thank you, Taylor, for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Yvonne, for the very motivational talk, which took the fear of the cervical smear away from our mind. We do hope that more women will come forward to screen and get the early treatment so that we can pre prevent the invasive cancer, cervical cancer, and achieve the WHO target to eliminate the cervical cancer. 
Thanks a lot, Dr. Yvonne. All the best for your MRCOT exam. Now, let me pass the floor back to Ms. Nicole. Thank you. Once again, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yvonne, as well as thank you, Dr. Kain, for chairing this session. Now, if you have any questions for Dr. Yvonne, please type out your questions in the slide link shown on the screen now, and it will be answered later. Now, I would like to call upon Dr. Lin Yin Se, Senior Lecturer in Pediatrics, School of Medicine, Taylor's University, who will be chairing this next part of our symposium. The floor is yours, Dr. Lin. Thank you, Nicole. Our next speaker is Ms. Genevieve Sambi. Ms. Genevieve Sambi is a model, former Miss Malaysia Universe runner-up, and the mother of two teenage children. Ms. Genevieve was diagnosed with cervical cancer when she was just 35 years old through a routine pap smear, which was done in year 2009. Today, she would like to share her story with us from the moment she received her diagnosis, the emotional turmoil of denial, anger, bargain, and later acceptance, and the journey she went through, she braved through the operation, the chemotherapy, and radiotherapy, till now, at present, a cancer survivor. After her treatment, Ms. Genevieve has been an ambassador for National Cancer Society of Malaysia, for Cervical Cancer Awareness. She has founded a Cervical Cancer Survival Groups in the heart of Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. She has spoken in many national and international platforms in the radio and television to talk about her audio and her vision. She wants to spread the message. She's campaigning for the HPV vaccination and screening for the prevention and early detection of cervical cancer. Today, Ms. Jennifer could not be with us due to prior commitment, but she has kindly recorded a video message for us and would like to take any question and reply later via email. Without further ado, uh, Nicole, can you play the video? Thank you. graduating from King's College London and the London College of Fashion, I returned to Malaysia and I was lucky enough to be one of Malaysia's top models for about 10 years. I have traveled the world for shoots and shows and I've emceed many events like the WTA Tennis Tournament, the Malaysian Open Golf, MAS and Ford Supermodel of the World. I'm a mother to two teenage kids and I now conduct grooming and etiquette training sessions where I share my experiences from my many years of modeling. I am also a cervical cancer survivor. I have been asked to talk today about my story and how I was given a second chance at life. I was diagnosed with cervical cancer at the age of 35. And as I went through the hardest seven months of my life, I vowed that if I came out the other side, I would do what I could to educate and build awareness about this dreadful disease. Now, cervical cancer is a disease that affects the cervix. Now, before I continue, does anyone even know where the cervix is? Honestly, you'd be surprised how many don't. In the, it is a part of the female reproductive system and is the lower part of the uterus. Or as someone said, once said to me, it's something down there. Or I often get, oh no, I'm so shy, la, don't want to say. Anyway, in Malaysia, cervical cancer is the third most common cancer amongst women, following breast, which is the first, and colorectal. Every day in Malaysia, there are six new cases of cervical cancer and two women lose their fight against this disease. This high mortality rate could be reduced through prevention, early diagnosis, effective screening and treatments. Now I remember the day my life came tumbling down. I was feeding my children dinner. My daughter Isabella was four and my son Alexander 15 months. My father rang. Now ironically, my father was a gynecologist 
and my mother a nurse. And two days earlier, on my mother's insistence, I had gone for my annual pap smear. My father explained that the results were not normal and more tests were needed. I was in a state of shock. Was I going to die? I had cancer. How was that even possible? The following day, more tests were done and we were assured that all was okay. And I would probably need some lasering done. However, all was not okay and I needed a cone biopsy. Some of you may know what a cone biopsy is. It's where a cone shape is cut away from your cervix. Two days later, I was checked into the university hospital and I had minor surgery. Unfortunately, 10 days later, I suffered a massive hemorrhage and I collapsed and was taken to hospital by ambulance. Two hours later, as I lay in hospital recovering, I was dealt my next blow. It seemed the cancer was spreading and most likely her his a hysterectomy was needed. This is when I sat and cried. I was going to die. Who would look after my babies? They were so young and they needed me. Now I tried bargaining with my doctor to give me a year, let me have another child. And I was so angry. Why me? Had I done something to deserve this? I felt very young to be losing my uterus and I just could not accept it. Everyone else knew what needed to be done, but I was in denial. It was only later that my brother, who's also a doctor, told me that cancer patients often go through four stages after receiving the news. They call it DARBA. Denial, anger, bargaining, and finally, acceptance. It's very important that the patient gets to acceptance. Without accepting the fact you have cancer, the mind and body can work against you. My mum had cancer. She has survived, luckily. But she never really accepted it and suffered with depression for a year after. Anyway, one day I woke up with a sense of calm and I realised how lucky I actually was. I had a little girl and a little boy and a husband who loved me and that was all I needed. I needed to be here for them and that was what was important. I had basically accepted the fact that I had cancer. A week before my hysterectomy, I had a routine ultrasound done. I remember the doctors and my dad whispering, trying to pretend everything was normal. They had found a massive mass in my cervix and it turned out that now I needed a radical hysterectomy when more than just my uterus would be removed. They would take all the surrounding areas and lymph nodes. It is what is often described by doctors as the king of surgeries. The following week, I checked into the university hospital again. I do remember it was the day that Michael Jackson died and the news and the radio were full of his songs. I remember thinking that if this was my last day, at least the music had been great. In the hour before my surgery, I sat with my husband and my cousin, all of us in tears and in shock, and I was so scared. As I truly believed I would not come out. We laughed about this the other day, but at that moment, there was no laughter. The surgery was long and drawn out. And five hours later, when I opened my eyes, it was my daughter's face that I saw smiling at me. Hi, mummy. This is an image that will stay with me forever. The relief that I had made it. Now the surgery was so painful, but the knowledge that I was okay and my family were with me made everything bearable. The following day, I asked my husband to help me out of bed and to walk. My dad did say that none of his patients who'd ever had a hysterectomy were able to get out of bed the next day, let alone try and walk. I asked him, how many of your patients were 35 years old? My family would come and have dinner with me in the hospital, trying to make me laugh and help me to walk. 
And these are the memories that stay with me and bring a smile to my face even now. I went home after a week. However, my next blow came 10 days later when the results showed that the cancer had spread and I would now actually need chemotherapy and radiation treatments. It was like I was in some sort of nightmare and I just wasn't sure how much I could take. What we couldn't understand was how I'd got to this stage. I went annually for my pap smears. So how in one year had I gone from all clear to stage three cancer and chemotherapy? The aggressiveness of the cancer shocked my doctors. This is a cancer that normally takes five to 10 years to get to the stage that I was at after less than one year. I started chemo and radiation a couple of weeks later. And I have to say, these were the hardest part. The severe vomiting, the diarrhea and the burning of the skin due to the radiation was unbearable. But I found that what kept me going was trying to keep my normal life with my kids. I continued where I could to take them to school and look after them at home. My daughter would sit with me in the afternoon when I got tired and would tell me, sleep, mummy, I'm here now. As I vomited, she would hold my hair and tell me everything was going to be all right. No four-year-old should see their mother like this, but she wanted to be with me. I used to call my daily hospital treatments my job. My brothers came over from the UK to help and friends would visit. And the amount of people who rang my parents and sent food and love surprised me. My parents' contractor made Chinese herbal soup for me. And there was someone who heard through friends of friends and sent herbs from Japan. So from Isabella, from Alexander, from Paul and my family came my strength to get through this. The times I wanted to give up and I cried, Paul would be there. Going through the final part of my treatment was 40 hours of internal radiation, which involved lying still for 40 hours with radioactive rods inside me and no one to see or speak to and an incredible pain. A picture of my family told me I had a reason to live. And then it was all over and I vowed to do something. I come from a medical family. As I mentioned, my dad was a gynecologist and my mother a nurse. And yet I knew nothing about cervical cancer. So if I didn't know anything about cervical cancer, then maybe others don't. And maybe I could help other ladies. I believe no woman should have to go through what I did. On paper, I am probably the last person who should have got cancer. I was young-ish. I've been with my husband since I was 20. I had two young children. I don't smoke and I drink in moder moderation and I exercise res regularly. Yet I still got cancer. So if it can happen to me, it could happen to anyone. So I have chosen to become an ambassador for cervical cancer. And I make it my mission to build awareness about pap smears and vaccinations. If I had not gone for my pap smear, I would not be here today. And my children would be without their mother. Cervical cancer is a treatable disease and prevention is the key answer to stopping cervical cancer. But unfortunately, the challenge is getting women to come forward to be screened. I've heard various reasons of why ladies won't go for their pap smears, ranging from shyness to discomfort to cost and also an avoidance of unpleasant news. Only 24% of Malaysian women are diagnosed in time at the early stage, while 76 of those infected can turn up at a later stage. A pap smear is the only way to detect cervical cancer. And through awareness, we have to end the stigma associated with cervical cancer and educate all women, girls 
and even husbands, brothers, fathers, and friends. I often tell people that a pap smear is a minute of embarrassment and discomfort. If it could save your life, I'd rather go through that embarrassing one minute every day than to endure what I had to. The human papillomavirus, HPV, causes nearly 99% of all cervical cancer cases. HPV is more common than you think, with 80% of men and women being infected with one type of HPV in their lifetime. HPV vaccines protect both men and women against cancers caused by HPV. Malaysia has an amazing HPV immunization program among 13 year olds. And this is something that we should be proud of. My daughter has been vaccinated and I feel secure in the knowledge that she is protected from having cervical cancer and she will never have to go through what I did. Like the saying goes, prevention is better than cure. I have been given a second chance and I feel that it is my duty to inform others about cervical cancer. As my father said, that is life. It's ups and downs that test us, allowing us to see what inner fortitude we are made of. Life is about change. So through TV, newspapers, radio interviews and talks, I tell people my story in the hope that I can save others the painful and frightening ordeal that I went through. I work with the National Cancer Society of Malaysia and I've become an ambassador for the power over cervical cancer, the silver ribbon awareness of gynecological cancers and the It's Your Life campaign. I have spoken at the Global Conference on Cervical Cancer held here in Kuala Lumpur and also at conferences held in New Delhi and Brazil. And I will put up with the nasty and hurtful things that people say, because there is always one person who will listen. And if I can save one person, then it is one person saved, and I have done my job. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Chenery, for an inspiring video. I'm sure her talk touches the heart of all of us. She endured the various cancer treatment and now a cancer survivor. But she did not stop there and shy away from the stigma of cervical cancer survivor. Instead, it became her life mission and she embarked on a new journey in her life camp to campaign for HPV vaccination and routine screening for cervical cancer and help to support the cervical cancer uh, lady. As we always mention, prevention is better than cure. With this, I will hand back the chair to Nico. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Zunibi, for your kind words and sharing. Thank you, Dr. Yim as well, for chairing the session. We will now have another short Q&A session moderated by Dr. Lim Su Yin, Senior Lecturer in Clinical Skills, School of Medicine, Kalos University. Over to you, Dr. Lim. Thank you, Nicole. Um, uh, we have now come to the uh, Q&A session uh, for our uh, very eloquent speakers, uh, Dr. Yvonne Peng and Ms. Genevieve Sambi. Um, but uh, due to other commitments, um, uh, Ms. Sambi herself is unfortunately unable to be here for our live Q&A session. Uh, but I'm told that she is happy uh, to be forwarded any questions directed to her if you state your email along with your question. Uh, in the meantime, I will invite uh, Dr. Yvonne Ping to address um, the questions that you see in front of you here. Um, so we have some, um, uh, quite a, a list of um, very practical questions. Uh, Yvonne, would you like to uh, take these? Uh, yes. So uh, for the first question, can pap smear be done during pregnancy? Yes, you can do the pap smear. And the risk of miscarriage is very minimal. And why we encourage to do pap smear during pregnancy is that 
um, a lot of women, like what we have discussed just now, um, they do not voluntarily go for cervical cancer screening. So if we can catch them during their pregnancy, which they will go to the clinic for their follow-up, we can then catch them at that time and encourage them to have a pet smear. So uh, this will actually uh, increase the cervical cancer screening uh, nationally. Um, so for the second question, uh, how should one prepare before going for a pap smear? Um, you know, I've heard a joke before people saying that uh, women preparing to go for a gynecological checkup is like preparing for their first date. You know, they will choose a proper attire, they will wear like nice uh, undergarments and they will wash themselves nicely before they go for their uh, gynecology checkup. So um, for a pap smear, um, what um, is being uh, recommended is that you do not have a uh, sexual intercourse uh, for two days prior to you getting your pap smear done and you should not uh, put any um, foreign uh, objects, any cream or jellies or even um, spermic spermicide cream as well um, prior to the pap smear because uh, this item, this object will actually wash out the abnormal cells so you want to uh, ensure that the abnormal cells are being picked up during the pap smear. Uh, and if possible, to arrange the pap smear when you are not having your menstruation. So this will uh, allow uh, more cells to be picked up, uh, do, uh, then can be viewed under the microscope. Uh, so uh, third one is regarding the cost. Uh, I believe I've answered that during my um, presentation just now. In private setting, it costs about 40 to 80 ringgit. While in garment setting, it is, uh, it is free, but you do need to pay the five ringgit if you want to see the specialist who will be conducting the pet smear on you. Um, the last question, uh, if a woman tests positive for HPV through screening, what about her male partner? Do men need to be screened and what advice do you give? Um, so this has been uh, discussed by the previous um, presenters as well, pre uh, doctors. Um, HPV uh, infection um, can go away by themselves. Uh, some of it does go away. Uh, after a few years, they do go away. So um, if a woman tests positive, it is uh, likely that the partner is also positive, but um, in uh, many cases, the infection goes away. And in men, there's currently no um, screening test being given to the men because we do not have an approved test yet. So the advice is the same for any uh, sexually transmitted infection advice that um, you know your risk and you um, minimize, your, minimize your risk by using um, condoms, by um, maintaining your loyalty to your partner. And in this case of HPV, um, we can also get vaccinated. So the men can also get vaccinated to protect themselves against uh, HPV. That's great. Thank you, uh, Yvonne. And I think these are really important questions because they do highlight that people are still uncertain about a lot of aspects of spike cancer and spike cancer screening and pap smears. And I think these little barriers, although they seem quite minor, do add up yeah, and do uh, uh, derail our plans to uh, try and eliminate cervical cancer. So, you know, having a platform to be able to answer these questions or address your concerns is really, really important. We still have a bit of time. And so while we wait for more questions to come, I, uh, I just, uh, I do have a question of my own. Um, and perhaps I, uh, you know, feel free for any of our expert gynecology panel members to also answer this. You know, as, as, as a woman, it's not nice to be poked and prodded. Five-year screening, uh, for cervical cancer screening uh, is a good compromise, of course. But, um, uh, you know, how, how far away are we from having a non-invasive test, screening test that could replace this, you know, something like a blood test um, you know, or, or is it fantasy? I know there's a lot, been a lot of interest in the field of oncology about using genomic sequencing, looking at uh, circulating cell-free DNA for various cancers, detecting very, very early stages of, of various cancers. You know. Is cervical cancer any different? Um, uh, maybe invite uh, Prof Ganesh to give your thoughts or um, uh, 
Anyone else? Hi, Suyin. Thank you so much for the question. So uh, for me, I, I do aware that we can do the DNA testing um, in the other cancer, like colon cancer, I have the own experience. Uh, but I am not, I'm not that sure for the cervical cancer, how, how early we can detect and then what is the percentage of that we can detect. So um, I think if it present also, it might be very, very early stage. But I do aware that other type of cancer, GI cancer, colon cancer, yeah, we can do the, um, this, this um, DNA testing and yeah, it's quite pricey also. Yeah, I mean, I, I imagine that they are, you know, implementing something like this, that's quite drastic, uh, quite then, drastic change. Yeah. yeah, you can do the, you can see the mutation and you can do the targeted therapy on that mutation. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, all these cancer can be, um, how to say, can be detected by liquid biopsy. There are yeah, many cancer can be liquid. I think HPV DNA can be detected via uh, liquid biopsy. But I think the ethical issue is you know you are carrying HPE vaccine. What is the future risk of you know, developing? And are you going to create that type of fear? You know, the, the liquid biopsy can detect, I'm not sure how many, maybe hundreds of uh, cancer. Is it fair to, you know, to, to burden the the, the person who spring that, the, the future risk for that, right? That I, I can't comment, but I think HPV can be screened via uh, liquid biopsy. I, I agree. I suppose, okay. you know, for something like this, you'd have to explore all the ethical possibilities, yeah, what to do with the positive result and how much impact is that actually going to be on the person, yeah? Um, can, I, can I just say something? Mm. Yes, please. Bye. do. Um, Okay, uh, the HPE infection is generally a localized infection. Uh, it, it is localized in the cervix. And I think um, um, uh, there are no real blood tests that are available for you to really screen for HPV. Um, but I think the, the fact that you have self-screening kits now uh, does help a lot. Uh, and it is expected that, you know, if we roll out the, the self-screening kits, you will be able to pick up uh, and triage patients very efficiently um, um, and, 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 and treat them appropriately. Um, the other thing I think that is in the, is the fact that you have a very effective vaccine and that we should encourage everyone to get vaccinated. Because if you get vaccinated, you can prevent up to about 90% plus cancers. There will be a small group of cancers that are not HPV related. And that's why you will need uh, cervical screening or things like that, even as you go forward. And then further down the road, I think they are developing therapeutic vaccines now for uh, treatment of cervical cancer. And they have begun some trials on that, as well as I think uh, uh, some sort of uh, seaweed-based gel that can actually kill the HPV virus, and that is also being developed and trialed. So there are lots of other things that are uh, coming up. But I think the most important thing about CA cervix is that there is a very long lag time between the point when you get infected with the virus and until you actually develop cancer. So if you pick it up very early, you can treat it very quickly. You can treat it very uh, easily uh, with very little morbidity and cost. And number two is that uh, a lot of women will actually get, almost every woman, once they become self sexually active, will be infected, but almost all of them will recover on their own. So you may not really need to do anything. Uh, to, to, um, to, to, you know, you, um, you, you may not, you know, if, if you start screening everybody, like what uh, 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 Dr. Lim said just now, you may be doing a lot and achieving very little. And I think that brings back to what Dr. Murli also said on Saturday, you know, uh, who do you screen and are the people who don't need screening being screened again and again? And I think that is also one major problem. Uh, we don't screen the people that need to be screened. Uh, the people who need screening perhaps don't need so much screening. 
That's why I think in countries where there's a lot of opportunistic screening, pushing the vaccine is very important, you know, because at least, you know, uh, you get one layer of protection. Even if you can't get them to go for a smear, at least you have vaccinated all of them, you know. Um, but I think it's screening, uh, it's, it's vaccination, screening and picking up early disease. And that is how we need to move forward. Thanks. Prof Ganesh, you know, that's very insightful. And I think that kind of reassures people a little bit, you know, that um, uh, with vaccination, with the proper measures and with less and less uh, types of invasive tests, you know, we can, you know, this, this is very doable. The final question that we have here um, is about access to the ROSE test. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so you can actually... Um, you can actually contact them via their website. It's either you go to the Get Involved page or you can contact uh, University of Malaya directly. Okay, that's wonderful. So let's hope people take note um, and make sure that um, uh, you know, people do have easy access and that's very important. Um, we have to move on uh, due to time constraints and uh, thank you uh, to everyone who has contributed to uh, our very insightful discussions today. I will hand the floor back to Nicole. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Thank you to all distinguished speakers for answering all the questions. We have now come to the time that everyone is waiting for, our prize-giving ceremony for the infographic competition and students empower quiz. So in conjunction with our cervical cancer elimination initiative, Taylor's University School of Medicine actually organized an infographic poster competition that was held on the 5th of November. It was open to all medical students in Malaysia to participate and we received a total of 17 entries from many medical schools. There were two categories for voting, the people's choice and judges choice. The posters were voted on by a panel of judges from OWSD and the top three winners voted by OWSD will receive cash vouchers worth RM250, RM150 as well as 100 ringgit. And the top three winners by People's Choice will each receive a gift hamper sponsored by Value Bazaar. So to all winners, our committee will get in touch with you to get your contact details. For now, let us watch a video compilation of all the creative infographic posters designed by the students. Apart from the poster competition, Taylor's University School of Medicine also organized an Empower InterVarsity quiz competition, which was held on the 6th of November. The theme was Women's Health, Cancer and Sexually Transmitted Infections. The quiz had a total of five rounds with 10 questions during each round. We had a total of 15 students from three different universities who, particip who participated and three of our fellow students managed to proceed to the final round, making them the top three winners. So on behalf of the school, I would like to congratulate all of the winners. Now, to present the prizes to the winners of the competition, let us all welcome Dr. Priya, Senior Lecturer in Microbiology, School of Medicine, Taylor's University. Over to you, Dr. Priya. Thank you very much, Nicole. I hope all of you had a good uh, symposium listening to the distinguished speakers and also the invited speakers. And now we have come to the most exciting part of this symposium. So would you like to know who are the winners of the infographics and also the quiz? Are you ready? All right, so first I would like to announce the winners of the people's choice for the infographics. These uh, so these are voted by the public. And uh, so the third prize will be to Sarvesh Gunandran 
from Taylor's University. So that is his infographic poster. Congratulations, Sarvish. Next will be the second place. That would be going to Nick Nur Ain Jana, Najat Amira, and Nur Hanis. So this is a group of these three ladies from USIM. Congratulations to all for being the second place winners. And next, for the first place, it will go to Lim Keying from Taylor's University. Congratulations to all these winners for People's Choice. And next, I would like to announce the winners of Judges' Choice. These judges were independent judges. They are from the Organization of Women in Science. So here they are. The third place goes to Haura Alali from Taylor's University. That's a poster. Congratulations, Haura. Next, for second place, Latisha Jesse Daniel from Taylor's University as well. Congratulations, Latisha. And the first place goes to Risha Ranjit from Quest International University. Congratulations, Risha, on your wonderful infographic. So that, that's all for the infographic winners. And next, we will proceed to the quiz competition. So this quiz was held on the second, uh, sorry, the 6th of December. So we also have three winners for this quiz competition. So the third place will go to Gurpreet Kaur. Congratulations, Gurpreet. Second place would be Vinashini Talayarasu. Congratulations, Vinashini. And the first place would be to Kishan Kumar. So congratulations, Kishan. Congratulations to all winners. And thank you for participating in this uh, infographics competition and also the quiz competition. All right, so uh, I will pass it back to Nicole. Once again, thank you to all participants who took part in our competition and congratulations to all the winners. We have now come to the closing ceremony of our Cervical Cancer Symposium. And with that, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Lin Yang Moon President of the Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World, Malaysia National Chapter, to, de to deliver her closing remarks. Okay, thank you, Nico. Oh, thank you so much. And a very good afternoon to uh, Dr. Ganesh, the chair of this uh, symposia, uh, cervical, uh, symposia, cervical Cancer Symposia, and also all the distinguished uh, speakers uh, from the first uh, days until today as well. Uh, to all lecturers, students, and uh, colleagues. Yeah? And uh, very well done to Dr. Kanish and also the organizing committee. I do believe that all participants, you will agree with me that, you know, for these two days, two sessions, there are so many uh, topics and also the contents on cervical cancer has been uh, discussed very well uh, by our speakers and also our uh, participants yeah? during the Q&A uh, session as well. Uh, well done for these sessions, and of course, um, you know, OWSD, uh, Malaysian National Chapter, would like to take this opportunity as well to thank to uh, Dr. Ganesh and also the organizing committee for inviting us to be part of these events. You know, this is a very um, meaningful event, and of course, uh, for us uh, women, uh, we need to be, you know, always update ourselves on all this knowledge here. Yeah? And uh, as highlighted by our speakers, you know, the incidents, we need to know about that and also how to prevent and how to take care of ourselves. Hopefully, all this will be reduced, uh, you know, um, in the future, uh, things like that, yeah. And um, to the organizing committee, as well as the judges from, come from the OWSD MNC, I uh, would like to thank all of you, yeah, uh, to be part of it and also to uh, work hard to really come up with the best uh, presenters and also the uh, winner for the quizzes. And I would like to mention that this is a great effort uh, to actually uh, engage our youngster 
uh, you know, to be aware and to get more knowledge about this uh, cervical cancer. So uh, with that, uh, thank you so much. And um, I hope everybody stay safe and stay healthy. Uh, that's all for me. Thank you so much. I hand over to you, uh, Nicole. Thank you, Dr. Lin Yang Meng. Okay, uh, let us now have a photo session together. So if everyone can turn on your camera, it will be great so that we can all snap a picture together. Okay, uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so everyone look into the camera and smile. One, two, three, smile again. One more time. One last time. Okay. Uh, Krishna, is it done? Okay, all good. Thank you very much, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now come towards the end of our symposium. Before you leave, allow me to make some announcements. To all medical doctors who wish to collect their CPD points, the QR code is currently being displayed on the screen. Also, please scan the link given in the chat box for feedback which also has the information for your certificate. I will, also use, I will also like to take this time to thank and acknowledge all our distinguished guest speakers, Dr. Dr. Soundary, Dr. Dr. Abdul Aziz, Dr. Yvonne Peng, and Ms. Junevi. Next, also acknowledging our organizing committee, Associate Professor Dr. Ganesh and his committee, Dr. Anita, Dr. Sapna, Dr. Lim Su Yin, Dr. Lim Yin Se, Dr. Priya, Dr. Naran, Dr. Wong Yin Hao, Associate Professor Dr. Yong Chai Hong, and all of Taylor's University Medical Students volunteers. On top of that, we would also like to thank Value Bazaar for their support and sponsorship given to this event. Thank you very much. Last but not least, we would like to thank all our participants here today. We could not have made this symposium possible without each and every one of you. So sincerely from the organizing committee, we thank you. So stay safe, everyone. Stay positive, and we wish all of you the best. Hope to see you soon. Bye. With, uh, Nicole, just uh, someone yeah. in the audience has asked, can you display the QR code for the uh, MMC oh, for sure. them to scan? I think it was a bit fast. Thank you. I will display it for a bit and uh, uh, QR code on screen. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the previous one. Uh, the MMC one. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Just leave that on for a bit. Thank you.